Good afternoon, everyone, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. My name is Danny Kwa. I am a professor in economics here at the school. It is my great pleasure this evening to get to host Mr. Yaron Jisobom for a public lecture. He has kindly agreed to speak to us for about 30 minutes, after which we will have the rest of the time for a question and answer session with you, the audience. The entire evening's event has to end by 6.30, but I'm sure we'll have plenty of time in the run-up to that. As you all know, Yaron is former president of the Eurogroup, former chair of the Board of Governors of the European Stability Mechanism, former finance minister of the Netherlands. We are grateful that he has been able to spend a couple of weeks here with us in Singapore at the Lee Kuan Yew School. His lecture this evening will be on the future of the Eurozone, nation building in times of crises. Before I hand over to him, let me just perhaps spend a couple of minutes uh, refreshing all our memories on some of the tumultuous events that lead to this, this uh, discussion. It's been a rocky decade. The US housing mortgage defaults of 2007 sparked off the 2008 global financial crisis. And 10 years after that, we have to remember that GFC was the largest single economic event of the last 80 years. Following the collapse of Lehman Brothers on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, freezing up of financial markets worldwide, the Eurozone itself, the monetary union of 19 member states that accept the Euro as common currency, the Eurozone itself too saw threatened sovereign debt or overextended bank defaults across the financially weaker member states. And if you cast your minds back, the Eurozone went into crisis mode. Bailout negotiations ensued between creditors, the incipient defaulting member states, and pretty much every large financial body in the world. The discussions grew to involve the IMF, the European Central Bank, and many others, with the numbers being talked about rising to trillions of US dollars. I lived in London at that time. And throughout the summer of 2015, those of us living in Europe, and in fact, everyone throughout the financial world, got to follow a blow-by-blow -blow account of the fraught negotiations occurring in Europe. Stepping back from Europe, there are those observers who, rightly or wrongly, trace Today, the current state of the world, nationalist populism in parts of the West, incipient deglobalization, indeed, disruption of the multilateral rules-based trading system, and even the accelerating of a global power shift away from the traditional centers in the West, leading potentially to a breakup of the liberal world order under which we have all lived and profited for the last half century. We trace from those events 10 years ago, today, US housing mortgage defaults, the 2008 global financial crisis, the European debt crisis. Now in that European debt crisis, Euron, our speaker this evening, president of the Eurogroup, the collection of finance ministers of the Eurozone member states, was at the very epicenter of the bailout negotiations between the European creditors and the potentially defaulting Eurozone member states. It is with great pleasure that this evening we get to warmly welcome him to deliver his lecture to us this evening. Please join me in applauding Euron. I, I want to say that I've now been a week in Singapore and already in this one week, there were two sort of world rankings that came out in which, again, Singapore and the Netherlands were in the lead. So I think one was the Human Capital Index, which was published by the World Bank. Singapore was one. 
closely followed by South Korea, the Netherlands, and Canada. The other one was, um, uh, where do I have it? It was an interesting one I didn't know. It was about the ranking of uh, the power of national brands. So what's actually the value of the brand Singapore or the brand the Netherlands? Um, and again, Singapore was number one and the Netherlands was number four, I believe, or number five, I can't read my own notes. So uh, Singapore was triple A plus and the Netherlands uh, only triple A, but in a good enough uh, place. And this happens all the time. So it's um, when I try to understand Europe or try to understand the Netherlands, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong? And you try to look up, so what countries are doing better? There is uh, always one and sometimes two or three that we can look up to. And Singapore is, is one of them. So we, it's always a great joy to be here to listen and to learn. Uh, but I also like to talk and I, I will mainly talk about uh, Europe tonight. We are now in a very different area in a very different period to the one you described, uh, Mr. Dean. We are now back into growth. Uh, the Netherlands is about at 3%, was 3% last year, probably be quite strong still next year. Unemployment has dropped. Um, purchasing power, so what do people actually have to spend, is finally improving. So domestic demand is improving. Um, and the budget is uh, very sound. So when I came in, it was going to minus four. We managed to stay away from that. And when I left the job, it was uh, a surplus of more than 1%. And also sovereign debt has gone down. Now this sort of tra trajectory that happened between 2013 and 2018 now is also true for the Eurozone to a large extent. Um, growth is back, it's broad based in all of our member states. There are of course differences but it is back in all member states. Uh, on average, this year, around 2%. Um, unemployment dropping fast, uh, on average, in the Eurozone. Uh, it was, at its peak, uh, over 12% on average, now below uh, 8 Inflation going up, which is something we had been waiting for for quite a while. Um, but perhaps even more important is that uh, the confidence that both producers, investors, and consumers have in our economy is much stronger than some years ago, which also is reflected in uh, higher investments uh, and consumer spending throughout the uh, Eurozone. Of course, there are worries. I'll say a little more about Italy and some other uh, particular cases later on. But overall, we are in a completely different uh, period. Going back to the start of the Euro, of course, it was always a political and an economic project. It was political in the sense that we want to cling our destinies together, in particular Germany and France. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, we wanted to make sure that our interests and future would be aligned and would not uh, diverge. It was also economic because we had in the 70s and the 80s and in the 90s many, many uh, currency crises. Uh, as Asia has had some, but we certainly had a number of those in Europe, creating a lot of political distress uh, uh, and economic damage. So the two elements of the euro have always been there, and that has also been true during the crisis. And I will say a little about what we did during the crisis to improve the monetary union, but the bottom line is always if there is no political will to make the project a success, you will fail. And I think that, looking back at this period, this 10 years of five years of deep crisis, five years of recovery, if you look at those years, it's mainly political will that got us through. Um, of course, at the start of the crisis, we found out what our weak spots were, as always. You think you set something up, you design frameworks and institutions, and then the crisis comes and the crisis always exposes the, the weak spots in how you've organized things. This is true in every country. And in the monetary union, there were quite a few weak spots. Because at the start, yes, we decided to have a euro. We decided to have some fiscal rules. We didn't decide to have any banking rules or institutions. We didn't uh, agree to have any common budget or uh, funds uh, to help us in bad times. There was basically very little there. 
and the weakness in the real economy also popped up. Um, the Europeans at the start of the crisis said, oh, this is an American problem uh, created by Lehman and by mortgages in America. But in fact, that wasn't true. Uh, the in Europeans had invested heavily in these mortgages in uh, the US, which cost them a lot of money. And that in itself then exposed major problems in our banks. Because over the course of these good years, I guess you could say between the start of the euro, the turn of the century, and 2008, in those years, we all reaped the benefits of the euro. There was lots of money available. Interest was low, and interest was low in all of our countries, leading to massive spending, a lot of credit going around, but unfortunately, very little productive investments. And so everyone was heavily indebted, but the actual structural strength of the economy had not improved. In fact, in many countries, in those so same years, wages went up much faster than the strength of the real economy. Uh, and that was detrimental to our competitiveness in Europe. All of those weaknesses were exposed when the crisis started. And in the first four years of that crisis period, there was basically a lot of um, national improvisation. We all went to save our banks. Also, we did in the Netherlands, uh, nationalizing banks, supporting banks. Almost all European countries did that. Um, we uh, did very little together. The only international initiative that had a impact was the G20 agreeing that all members or all states should invest to get through that crisis, which worked initially. There was an economic recovery in 2011 but it didn't deal with the structural problems that we had in Europe. So it didn't, that recovery didn't last. There's a lot more I could say about that, but that first four years, four years was, can be summed up by improvisation and disagreements. Pretty fundamental disagreements within the Eurozone about how far are we in this together? Is a member state that is no longer um, financially viable? Can he turn to help to other European member states? Will we bail each other out or not? That was a huge debate. Um, can we, do we need to save banks and do we need to do that at a national level? Should we do it in, at a European level? Uh, sharing those risks, a major debate. And that, all of that costs us four years and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Europe and the Eurozone in particular was so slow coming out of the crisis. And it was mid-2012 when a couple of things happened which changed that. The first one was the government leaders took a very important decision, which was that they would create a banking union. There had been lots of debate about that for years, but now they said we really need it. We need to have common rules for the banks, common supervision, and a common framework for bank resolution, how to deal with a bank that is no longer viable. The second thing that happened mid-2012 was, and this was only two weeks after, Mario Draghi was at a conference in London. It was an investor conference where the atmosphere was so negative about the future of the euro that he decided to come out quite forcefully and said, we will do whatever it takes and you can be assured it will be enough. Now, why that statement had such an impact, um, I, I, I never know for sure. I know for sure now that it was improvised, so the, the, sort of the atmosphere at the conference made him say it quite forcefully. And I think a factor was that within a couple of days, Angela Merkel came out publicly and said she would support Mario Draghi. She supported his statement which, as you know, German politicians don't like to talk about monetary policy because they are, monetary policy is independent. And I think this was the only time, in my recollection, the only time that Angela Merkel publicly said anything about Draghi's policies. So, and she said she supported it, and that made it a very sort of credible statement, the fact that she came out to support it. Uh, the third thing that happened mid-2012 was uh, the start of the ESM, which is um, the big emergency fund of the Eurozone, um, allowing uh, the countries to jointly step in. There had been bilateral loans to support countries losing access to markets. 
There had been EFSF, which was a temporary arrangement, and now there was a bigger arrangement, permanent, pre-funded by capital input by the member states, called the uh, ESM. And the ESM has functioned very well, very effectively, very efficiently, uh, basically bringing in cheap uh, money, then giving it out to those member states that uh, needed financing uh, on conditions of reforms. Um, those three things were the first really sort of game changers in the Euro crisis. Uh, and on that basis, I started my work uh, at the end of 2012. The thing that I spent most time on um, was not Greece, though you may expect uh, that. It was indeed the banking union, because I was assured that I was certain that uh, the main reason why the European economy was not recovering, not coming off uh, the ground, is, was that our banks were still not in a good shape. They had been saved everywhere by putting public money in, but that was just to keep them alive. There had not been a deep restructuring. There had not been a solid recapitalization. Uh, and the ongoing um, economic crisis was eating away at the, the assets of the banks. More and more non-performing loans were holding it all back. And the banking union basically already at the start, made our banks recapitalize. Even before the supervisor, the European supervisor came in, the banks knew that they had to recapitalize because otherwise Frankfurt, where the ECB is, would make them recapitalize. So lots of banks went to markets, brought in new money, uh, and supervision has been much stricter then. Of course, capital requirements uh, agreed in, in the Basel agreements have been gradually increased and increased and are still increasing. So European banks are still improving their balance sheets, both on the capital side and also dealing with these non-performing loans, which is still ongoing. Non-performing loans in some countries are still quite high and need to be reduced further, and also that is ongoing. Uh, then there are lots of issues of further improvement that the discussion in Europe now is about, in the Eurozone now is about. To put it simply, I would say that the first priority is to finish the things that we started. So the banking union is not finished, and we started another project called the Capital Markets Union. So when we talk about banking union, we have now the one supervisor over all the large banks, uh, supervising about 85% of the balance sheets of all banks uh, in Europe, um, we have, of course, the capital requirements and the single rule book, which is gradually being, becoming more and more single. We have the single resolution board, which is a new institution that is built uh, in uh, Brussels, based in Brussels, uh, that will now deal with any major bank that gets into trouble, uh, deciding how it should be dealt with, wound down, uh, or taken into restructuring, etc. Uh, that's done, even though it's still work in progress. Those institutions are set up and have been set up in a very short period of time. The issues that are still open is basically some of the um, um, legacy issues that we still have, we need to get rid of. Uh, in a number of banks, the concentration of sovereign bonds of their own government is very high which means that if the government gets into trouble, the bank will get into trouble. If the sovereign bonds lose their value, then the bank has a major problem uh, in its uh, balance sheet. That has to be reduced, uh, and uh, work in most countries is ongoing on that. Uh, the second issue I already mentioned, the non-performing loans that need to be uh, managed much better and need, uh, for a large part, to uh, be taken off the bank balance sheet so the banks can put out new credit and create space in their portfolios. Um, the bit that is really missing in the banking union is the, um, what is called the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. I think that's an important last step, and I'm very much in favor of it, though um, many of the countries in the north of the Eurozone are not. I am. Uh, but to put it in perspective, we have already uh, fully harmonized the 
insurance schemes per country. So each country has the same standards, is uh, pre-financing a deposit fund. So if things go wrong, the money is there um, because it's been uh, put there by the banks, by bank con contributions. Uh, but my argument would be if we really want to create uh, one integrated banking uh, market, if we really want to create trust also among depositors uh, in our banks, then once all those national funds are filled, which should be done in about six years, then we should really connect them and make them into one insurance scheme, much stronger. And those six years can also be used to address old risks, legacy issues in the banks. So that is quite urgent. It's not popular in some countries, as I said, but it, um, I think, will happen. Uh, the question is under what conditions and in how many years. Another structural issue regarding the banks is Europe is overbanked, and this is certainly also true for the Eurozone. We, our economy depends for 80% on bank loans, which means that, um, well, it has a, a number of effects. One is that if the economy is hit, if trust is, runs out, then all those risks immediately also go to the bank. And that's why the banking crisis in Europe had such, so much more impact than in the US. In the US, it's almost the other way around. 25% of the American economy is financed by bank loans. And 75% uh, is financed by capital markets, by equity, by investors. And that is a way to, um, a different way to absorb shocks to distribute risks when they occur in a crisis. And I think this is one of the key things that still structural key things that needs to be addressed in our economy. Uh, we are overbanked, over dependent on bank financing, which also creates a uh, different characteristics of our economy. Um, I would argue that if we had more of a equity culture, it would also influence how innovative our economies would be. Uh, because those people that invest in a company or provide equity uh, will look at that company and perhaps interfere with that company uh, more directly uh, and look at it more critically than a bank does. A bank is quite happy as long as you do your payments. But if you're an investor, you may want to go into the boardroom and say, okay, what are your plans? And how are you going to improve the return that I'm getting on my equity? So I think this is one of the explanations why the European economy is not as competitive as the US or not as competitive as um, uh, Asia is because we don't have that strong equity culture. And that's what that other project was about, the Capital Markets Union. So I think that should really be back on the agenda. The, the, the current European Commission started work on it when we still had an, a British commissioner, uh, Lord Hill, he took the lead. Since he's gone, it's, it's not very vibrant. Capital Markets Union is crucial uh, to get new, diverse finance to our economy, to be able to absorb shocks in the future much better, and to create a much more innovative, equity-driven culture in our companies. Then there are lots of other uh, issues um, which are debated about the future of the Eurozone. One has to do with fiscal policies and the possibility of members to default and how should we address uh, debt? One way to look at that is to say, look, um, fiscal policy at a national level is still very, very important. Um, the budgets, the accumulated uh, budgets at national level are 50 times the size of the European budget. So um, can we transfer that to the center? Can we centralize that and create a political union? I don't think so. I think politically that's totally unthinkable. It would be a huge gift to the populace. Mm -hmm. But also if you look at the structure and the political um, organization of our societies, uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to make a big leap forward and say from now on, uh, social policies, education policies, pension systems will all become European. So that won't happen. So national budgets will still be very important and national sovereignty to a large extent will still remain. Um, then how can the commission control the fiscal policies which the commission is supposed to do? It's almost impossible. So there is an argument to say perhaps we should 
allow countries more fiscal space, flexibility, uh, autonomy again, but it would have to come back, um, it would have to go with, if things go wrong, they must be able to default and still remain in the Eurozone. Now, the only way to do that is if we, if we have a proper mechanism, a, a, a design which is known and agreed in advance on how to deal with uh, unsustainable debt. This is called a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. If a country can no longer pay off its debt, but it, ha it has had fiscal autonomy, uh, then these debts must be restructured. I don't, this is one path. It basically goes back to how in the Treaty of Maastricht, at the beginning of the Euro, it was designed. Um, and surprisingly, there are supporters of this way of thinking about debt restructuring, fiscal policy, uh, both in the North and the, south, and the South. The other option is, of course, that we make the rules much more simple, uh, basically ask the Commission to do their job, uh, not allow for all this flexibility uh, and say you must take your responsibility, you're in the Eurozone, that's what you must do. Um, but at the current situation, the rules are unclear, there's lots of flexibility, the Commission is struggling to implement the rules um, and our credibility is at stake. So this is a big topic. Uh, having a Debt restructuring mechanism also impacts the banks because the banks have so much sovereign bonds. So if you say these sovereign bonds now are cut in half, they lose part of their value, and you can do this in different ways, then that would hurt the banks a lot. So we need to address this issue of concentration of sovereign bonds in our banks quite uh, urgently. Um, I don't want to go into all, I probably have too much technique already for you, I apologize. Then there is a debate about a Eurozone budget, having a specific budget. Why? Um, basically, if there is a crisis, if it's in all of our countries, then we have the ECB and monetary policy to put a blanket over that and to help everyone. If it's specific in one country, the ECB can't really help. So then we could be helped by a dedicated Eurozone budget to support uh, aggregate demand in that country or to protect public investments different ways of doing it. I'm certainly not against that, uh, but I would argue that don't get your hopes up. It's not going to be very big. I think it will come, actually, because President Macron is making a big point out of it, and I believe that um, Angela Merkel has already shown some willingness here. But it won't be very big for the simple reason that um, there are huge budgetary discussions already in Brussels. When the UK leaves, they take away quite a chunk of the money. They are a net payer to the EU budget. So finding spare money in Brussels is quite a job. And if the member states have to finance it, uh, they may not be so enthusiastic about the idea. But we'll see. What I definitely don't like is the idea of a Eurozone Minister of Finance. First of all, we don't have a Eurozone government, so where would he be institutionally? What is, would his cons constitutional position be? What would his powers be? Um, I mean, even if there is a Eurozone budget, I think it'll be small, so it's not as if, and it will be reserved only if there is uh, a crisis in a certain country. So it's, it's not like um, a normal Minister of Finance would have quite a sizable budget and would be able to go to financial markets and to give out bonds and all of that. All of that is uh, not foreseen for the Eurozone. So I, I don't think that is a great uh, idea. What are the main risks now? Um, obviously, it's political, um, both inside and outside the Eurozone, uh, and it's populism, both inside and outside the Eurozone. Um, so now, now, if you look at Europe, you'll see a lot of unstable governments, and that's my biggest concern. I mean, next steps are needed to strengthen the monetary union, to address structural issues in our economies, to do reforms of our pension system, of our labor markets. There is still a lot of things still on our agenda. But if the governments are all, they either have a minority in parliament or they are broad coalition governments, the German coalition seems to be only discussing and fighting among themselves. 
in Sweden, we don't have a government at the moment, very difficult to form one. The Spanish government has no majority. The Italian government, ah, I was going to talk about Italy. <laughs> so, it's, this, is, this is where we are. So my biggest concern is, is politics. Of course, also outside, and I'm sure maybe in question, in, in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit about international politics. Italy is, um, is quite a challenge to all of us because there is a democratic, legit uh, elected uh, government consisting of two populist parties who agree on only one thing, we don't like Europe. And that's what they agree on. Uh, but of course, they know where their interest lies, and that is inside Europe and inside the Eurozone. Italy has not addressed the structural issues, which, by the way, were already there before the crisis. So already before the crisis, investment was very low in Italy. Productivity was zero. It wasn't increasing at all. Uh, sovereign debt was already very high. Uh, structural unemployment was relatively high. And uh, the banks, uh, there are an enormous number of banks in Italy, uh, and um, those banks were not very uh, strong and sound already before the crisis. And of course, the crisis made all of this uh, worse. The current plans um, are reforming the tax system and the social system, which I think both are great ideas, uh, but not the way they are proposing it, and certainly not at the same time. If you want to lower taxes quite radically and at the same time provide much better social benefits in Italy, uh, you need to borrow a lot of extra money. Uh, and with a debt that is about 132%, where's that money going to come from? On top of that, you need to know that uh, the, the stock of debt that Italy has needs to be refinanced, and it's relatively short term, which means that in the coming five years, they need to refinance very large amounts. So, uh, if my information is correct, in the coming five years, it's roughly between 200 and 250 billion per year, just refinancing the existing debt and then the plans will create more debt issues. Uh, while interest is going up for Italy, creating more debt issues, economy, economic growth is slipping, creating more fiscal issues. So it's a serious concern. The only thing I can say is that I don't think the financial markets will sort it out. I don't think that Europe will step in uh, nor to correct, well, hopefully to correct, but certainly not to save Italy, for the simple reason that the funds that we have uh, are not enough to finance these enormous numbers that we're talking about. Um, so Europe can't save Italy, so Italy will have to save itself. That may sound very harsh, but I think that's the way it is. And the way things are going, it'll get worse first, uh, but then it'll be corrected, but it needs to be corrected uh, inside uh, Italy. I don't think Europe or the institutions of the Eurozone are in a position to step in and correct the fiscal policy uh, there. The contam contamination of what's going on in Italy on other countries is very limited, so that shows that confidence in itself in the Eurozone uh, is much stronger now. The kind of contamination and spillovers that we saw in the early days of the crisis are not uh, there uh, now. Um, I probably should stop uh, looking at the time, and maybe we can talk about the international dimensions uh, during the Q&A. Amazing, insightful survey of you know, many different things going on, but I, I jotted down three points in particular that I thought we might uh, push on. The first is the good economic news from the European recovery. Good. The numbers are, are, are settled in nicely. A huge turnaround from the crisis of 10 years ago. Uh, second, you delineated for us very clearly boundaries on what European policymakers can and cannot do. The ideas that you've described for us are on different kinds of uh, resolution mechanisms that will transform the face of European finance and policymaking, but at the same time being very clear but where sovereignty and, and formation of the European state can take us. And then third, you pointed to us the dangers, the political instabilities that you see across different member states in Europe. Of course, all this, the, the 
So the exciting <coughs> things people talk about are the dangers, and the dangers also are now taking place against a, a background of a large U.S.-China confrontation. And while you know originally we might have viewed looked on Europe, the great liberal heart of the world as being the mediator, the moderator, the one that calms temperatures with the potential political instability within member states that raises the stakes even higher. So that's the, if I'm, if I, yeah. I hope I'm not misinterpreting, but that's the, the landscape you've set out for us, the good news and then the slightly worrying news. Um, I would like to open the floor to, to questions or remarks or observations. Um, yes, we'll take, we'll take a number of questions in, 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 in a group, and I'll hand over for me, sir. Uh, perhaps you could identify yourself quickly. I'm from Ye, I'm doing research on monetary economics. Now on November 4, the US sanction is going to be imposed on Iran, and the uh, European Commission and the European Central Bank has said you're going to put an alternative settlement mechanism to allow the European companies exempted from the US sanctions. And also you are going to pull up the blocking stages to allow European companies not to obey the US sanction orders. There's a lot of talks now uh, around that this is going to be a mechanism that is going to get away from the US dollar dominated settlement mechanisms. So how shall we on that and consider it's only three weeks away? So how is this mechanism going to work? Will the US and EU go into kind of a confrontation over this issue? So I think that the big issue here is how is Europe going to act or what position is it going to take in the big conflict, US-China? And uh, I think both these examples, whether they're all realistic and are actually going to work, in the short run, maybe not. Um, but it shows that the EU is pretty determined not to stay the junior partner of the US the way the US is uh, setting out at the moment. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the most important answer to your question. The US is, uh, the, the EU is um, going to find its own way. And interestingly enough, you know, lots of topic, topics in the EU lead to divisions. For example, how should we relate to Russia? Now there you find lots of different opinions in Europe. Some want to take the hard line, more sanctions, and some want to say we should get rid of the sanctions, etc. When you talk about how should we relate to China, I think there's more agreement. Because I think every European country is interested to work with China. Um, and uh, certainly when the U.S. is taking, is no longer leading uh, in the model that it has built itself. I mean, we are talking about a world order, uh, open trade, etc., rule-based system that the U.S. Has, has built in the post-war period, and they are now saying, we don't want it anymore. Uh, and it's being orphanaged, and um, we are prepared to take it in, and we hope that China is also, and that would be a great basis to work with China. So this week there is an EU-China summit, and I would hope that there will be some serious discussions on topics that we can move forward on, uh, one being climate, um, for example. Um, now going to the specifics of your question, so the first one is... Um, um, my understanding is to create a fund where transactions between EU companies and Iran can be settled uh, other than by dollars. Um, technically, that can work. It's, it's been done before. Uh, during the Cold War period, it was done in, uh, to uh, manage transactions between Europe and Russia. Um, the question is whether the larger European companies that also do business in the U.S. Uh, would make use of it, and I think not, because the U.S. will, of course, still know uh, and still find ways, and this is a big issue um, to um, impose sanctions uh, on those companies. Uh, it's a big issue, and that brings me to the second element in your question. Can we, can the EU protect companies that would still uh, do business. Or uh, I think the formulation is, can they forbid companies to abide by the American rules? I don't, I don't see that. Um, 
So in the short term, I think these are political signals, which I hope will be consistent, political system, uh, signals towards the US. We will not take your lead on these issues. Uh, in the short term, it won't have a material effect, I think, because ma major companies already, major French camp companies and German companies have said, oh, we're not going there, it's too tricky. Um, but in the long run, I think that uh, it's an important sort of trend. It's an important change in trend. Whether uh, the EU can be uh, the next currency of the world or the Remimni, uh, certainly not in the short run, uh, given simply the size of the American uh, economy and the um, number of tr transactions worldwide being done in uh, dollars. But I was struck by the enthusiasm in Russia, who s immediately said, uh, why don't you from now on pay your energy bill in euros? You're very welcome to do that. So again, um, there are uh, a number of global regions that are looking at if the US is going to behave like the bully of the world, how can we get out of that being bullied? Um, and there is a lot of interest in that topic in Europe. Uh, first one is, uh, you mentioned that you, you want Europe to be more equity driven in the future. Then how, how could Europe, Europe be more equity driven while the whole European Union seems to have more supervision and regulation? We have seen European banks scaling down their business in Asia, like Bakri closing down a whole uh, equity business in Asia. So, so this seems to contradict each other. The second question is, uh, China Central Bank has been doing some research on pushing forward for central bank cryptocurrency. So how is this development in Europe? Push for what, sorry? Uh, central bank cryptocurrency is, is a new uh, way to basically change the current relationship between the central bank and the commercial bank. So how is European yeah. countries doing all this? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I might have seen an interview quite recently where you said you felt now that um, the euro, the, the eurozone, expected too much of Greece um, and, the, and the Greek people in terms of the austerity measures that were imposed. <clears throat> and it seems to me that there is a disconnect between a lot of people in Europe and in the European Union and the people who govern the European Union and, and all of its various institutions. Do you think that other people who were involved in some of the decisions that were made at that time have come to a similar conclusion about the austerity measures imposed? And if so, if not, or are not, and if they have, what, what do you think they can do about it to repair that, that fundamental trust that seems to have been broken between the European people and, and the, the politicians and the bureaucrats that govern them? First of all, I think, uh, the fact that banks are heavily regulated doesn't mean, as a, as a matter of fact, could help in creating a more equity-financed economy. To give you one example, if you were to raise um, the leverage ratio for banks, so this is the amount of real their own equity, their own capital, if you would pretty drastic, drastically improve that, some economists say it should go to 10% or 20%, then banks could take a lot more risks and invest uh, more uh, risk uh, taking, uh, which now, simply because of the fact that they hardly have any capital, and governments are very concerned that if they get into trouble, they need to be saved again. This is why governments are telling banks, you must be very careful and avoid risks. So there is another approach, another way to look at it. Um, and whenever banks say to me, or said to me, because I'm no longer in a job, Whenever they said to me, oh, Miss, Miss, Mr. Minister, can we have less rules, please? But this compliance is driving us crazy. I, I always said to them, that's fine. I'm prepared to make that deal if you have a lot more capital, if your leverage ratio goes up, because then I'm, I will relax. I know that if you have losses, you can absorb those losses. Uh, so that's the trade-off. Um, so I don't think there is a contradiction uh, there. Central bank cryptocurrency, um, the interesting th thought about it, of course, so far theoretically, is that we have now in the Netherlands quite a debate about who actually creates the money. 
people always thought it was the government or the central bank, but in fact, of course, it's commercial banks that basically, by uh, putting out loans, create uh, money in a sense. You could say, but I think it's a huge public interest at stake, so why doesn't the central bank take control of this process? And here, is a, there's an interesting link with if the central bank were to manage the cryptocurrency, perhaps that's the way to do it. It's so far very theoretical. I mean, it would be, I don't think we've really thought it through. When I was a minister, I asked for a study by our scientific council on particularly this topic, the question of who creates money and should that be changed in the future. They're still studying on it, I think. Mm, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's so complex. The Swedish central bank has done work on it. Uh, and was quite enthusiastic, so that would be interesting. Uh, but this is all in the early uh, stages. So on uh, Greece, uh, I didn't say much about Greece, but I know I always get questions about Greece, so. Um, what I said was, and I, uh, I wrote a book on the Euro crisis, and in this book I'm also very critical of how we managed the Euro crisis. And looking at Greece, we made uh, a number of mistakes. Some were before my time, and some were during my time. So before my time, the biggest mistakes were, of course, made by Greece and previous generations of Greek politicians. I can't be nice about it. The country has been mismanaged for decades. It's really, really sad to see that in a period in which there was so much econo economic progress and economic growth, at the end of that period, uh, the public sector in Greece had been uh, neglected, damaged badly, uh, there was a, when the real figures came out, already a deficit of 15%, and sovereign debt was already, this was at the start of the crisis, already at 120%. And this was after 15 good years in Greece. I mean, I can still get pretty upset about it, the kind of political mismanagement. Anyway, then the next mistake was made that, and this was done everywhere in Europe, the banks were saved by taxpayers' money. And my political and economic belief is that if an investor decides to put money in Greek banks or in Dutch banks or in Spanish banks, which are not sound, then that's a bad mistake. And if it goes wrong, uh, the banks or the investors should pay the price and take their losses. In the case of Greece, uh, a lot of the financing to the banks was provided from France and Germany. Um, so what should have happened is not recapitalize the banks fully with taxpayers' money, to say to those investors, wherever they're from, look, you will only get half of your investment back. Or if, that's already quite a big haircut, by the way, but let's, as an example, say. Um, that would have, so the biggest increase in the sovereign debt for Greece, which of course led to austerity questions, was caused by the way these banks were handled. And it was done everywhere in Europe. Also in the Netherlands, uh, sovereign debt boomed due to the banking issues. In Ireland, Ireland is probably the strongest example, they had a sovereign debt of 25% before the crisis, and after they saved the banks, it was 125%. So could we have avoided austerity, even if we had not done, dealt with the banks in this way? We could not have avoided austerity in Greece. I mean, if at the start of the crisis your deficit is minus 15%, you need to get, you need to sort it out. Could it have been done more gradually? Yes. I think the targets in the beginning in those first two programs were uh, immense. So I think in the first program, Greece was expected to reduce the deficit from let's say minus 15 to minus three in three years time or something like this. Never been done. And um, that was very, uh, tough in the beginning. So what happened in my period, we also made mistakes. One of the things that I mentioned was that we asked too much of the Greeks. This was not about austerity. What I said was we asked too much. We asked them to reform everything at the same time. So the, the tax uh, services, the, the whole administration, the, the economy, all the sectors, all the ministries, the energy sector, blah, 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 everything. That also can't be done realistically. I mean, We've done some, uh, quite a few reforms at the same time in the Netherlands in the crisis years, and things still went wrong. 
but we didn't do as much as the Greeks were asked to do. And if you have a strong civil service and a well-functioning government, then perhaps you can do a little more. But that wasn't the case either in Greece, sadly. So that was not very wise. We should have prioritized. Uh, I just wondered if there's something that has been learned. It doesn't mean that the decisions that were made were wrong, but, but is, it not, is there not some reflection to be done if the European Union and, and the Eurozone is going to stay together? Yeah. Um, because sometimes I feel from European bureaucrats that they're too concerned with defending their choices in the past rather than looking forward and thinking, what, what can we, how can we repair this broken trust? That was the crux of my question. I wasn't trying to criticise you or tell you to defend. No, no, I wasn't uh, trying to be defensive, but it is important to understand why we got into the situation with Greece that we got into. And um, what I uh, will fight is the idea that the crisis in Greece was caused by the European programmes. And sometimes, if you sort of filter out the whole debate and all the details, and this is what is left on the sieve. Uh, yeah, but I'm afraid that's, that's not the whole story. So the things to learn is uh, some of the things I already mentioned. We shouldn't deal with the banks ever again. Uh, we should not uh, uh, allow uh, fiddles, uh, figures to be fiddled. We should ask national politicians to be responsible for their own country. It's inevitable. Um, uh, we should use good times to build fiscal buffers so we don't have to immediately have austerity when things get uh, bad. Um, we should have better institutions in which we can help each other, which we now have, by the way, but they're not completely finished and done. So I think on all of those topics, we've made a lot of progress already. So when people say, ah, but what are you going to do the next time around? I'll promise you one thing, the next crisis won't be the last crisis. That's always the truth. I mean, that's always true. We always are discussing how can we win the last war? The next war will be very different. Uh, it'll maybe comes from a different part of the world. It may be caused by different things. I think it's very unlikely that it'll be in the European banking sector because so much work has been done. Uh, some still ongoing, but so much work has been done. So the political crisis and populism my simple answer would be that Europe has been for a very long time about creating security and prosperity. And Europe delivered on that. For a very long time, people felt very secure. We didn't have wars set aside Yugoslavia, unfortunately, but in uh, the European Union. And uh, prosperity increased in the whole post-war period. And two things happened at the same time, and the financial crisis came on top of that. But even without the financial crisis, for the first time in Europe, and it's also true in the US, we can no longer say that the next generation, our children, will for sure do better than we did. That's no longer true. Mm -hmm. We've made, part of it is because we made so much progress. My, great, my, my grandfather was a postman, my father was a teacher, and I became a minister. I mean, there's little chance of my children topping that. I mean, they could, but. Um, so, but this is true for us. This is true for our society. So it's a it's a it's a major break after long, long period of economic improvement, and it creates insecurity. And then we have insecurity from uh, migrants coming in, and people feel, well, my my future, economic future, or the future of my children is already more uncertain uh, than mine was. Uh, and then these migrants coming in, they take our house, they take our job. Whether that's true or not, but a lot of people get that sort of anxious. Uh, and on top of that, we've got terrorism. Terrorist attacks in all the major cities of Europe. Uh, yeah, people are very anxious about that. Um, can it be managed? Yes, if we return to those two key promises that Europe always had. Security. So this is about, can we manage migration? I don't want to close the borders. Absolutely not. I'm for migration, but it, we need to show that we are managing it. That we control terrorism, keep it down, and that in economic terms we deliver for a broad part of a society and not just the few that uh, are in the sort of international elite flying around uh, like myself. Um, <laughs> it needs to be for a broad part of society. Anyway, I can talk about this for hours.
Thank you very much for that for that answer. I mean, I thought your your answer, Minister, was extremely sympathetic and touched on all the right points, but it didn't shy away from making the difficult points that it needed to. You said that you know uh, we might have asked too much for of Greece in the way we tried to get it to reform everything at once. I worry sometimes that we ask too much of austerity in that we think it fixes all these different things. Mm. I mean, there's one kind of austerity that's intended to target the ongoing moral hazard problems of banks and, and other agents taking on too much risk. They're expecting to be bailed out. There's a different kind of, of austerity that perhaps uh, could be more sympathetic with you know, Keynesian business cycle ebb and flow, mm. which might well not call for a, a kind of harsh austerity that we want to impose on the moral hazard segments of our economy. Mm -hmm. And we asked in, in Europe, we asked too much of austerity. We asked it to fix all these problems at the same time. Uh, uh, two, uh, two points in reaction. The first is that it may seem that the Eurozone strategy was just about austerity. But it was not. It was about dealing with banks, creating banking units, etc. It was about creating new funds at a Europe's own level, which we could help to intervene. And that, I think, one of the steps, the concrete steps that will be taken, hopefully already at the end of the year, is that th this fund is then developed into a European monetary fund, which we can use even more uh, directly. Uh, it was about an investment agenda, so we created the Juncker Plan and the, uh, the FC, which is a new investment instrument for Europe quite sizable. So it was a multi-pronged strategy. Austerity, certainly after the second crisis, had become inevitable simply because so many countries were losing or were at the risk of losing access to markets. Now, how can we avoid this in the future? Um, only if we take uh, both sides of the Keynesian theory. So Keynes didn't just say the government needs to spend more, full stop. He said the government needs to spend more in bad times when there is little confidence and everyone is retracting and putting their money back, then the government should step in. But in good times, the government should reduce its intervention and uh, be austere and create fiscal buffers for the bad time. And that's a theory. Now, if we don't do that second part in the good times, then we will be forced again to be austere in the bad times, which is bad policy. I absolutely agree. I mean, I'm an economist. I understand the theory. Uh, I had to do lots of uh, expenditure cuts in the Netherlands. And, and economists would say to me, oh, this is all wrong. And I said, you're right. Uh, it's just that we didn't create enough fiscal space and enough buffering. Or, to put it even more correctly, we allowed the problems, the risks, to become so big that the fiscal space that we did have was simply inefficient, in insufficient. So let's manage those risks better or make them private again instead of making them public problem. Create fiscal space while things are good in Europe. Um, and then austerity won't be certainly not sort of at the heart of our policies. Um, I hope that we can do both sides of the Keynesian yeah, theory. absolutely. Thank you very much. Kanti. We just heard today that 80 to 85 percent of an agreement seems to have uh, been hammered out by both sides, which may still mean that there's still 15 percent to go, which might be very difficult. But my question is about Italy. Uh, I mean, there has been pressure in Italy to also consider an exit. And uh, with the recent elections and the coming to power of a uh, new government, um, Will the Italians have an incentive in their bad times to look to Brexit or look the other way? To, uh, would you like to hazard some guesses, prognostication? So there have been, um, uh, uh, in certain parts of uh, almost all of our countries, debates about a Frexit, an exit, an Etexit, uh, you name it. Uh, and if you look at polls, um, in almost all of our country, countries, a quite a strong majority says, no, 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 we should stay in the Eurozone and stay in uh, Europe. That was even true for Greece at the height of the crisis in 2015 when we had a radical left government fighting us on every uh, corner. Uh, and that's why my guess was always that even this radical Greek government would in the end choose to strike a deal with us. Mm -hmm. And I also guess that 
at the end, Angela Merkel would not allow the Greeks to go because it would be on her history page, if you understand the meaning. So this is true in all of our countries, also in Italy. Uh, the Italians understand very well that the, their future sort of financial stability, the value of their assets, uh, very much depends on whether they're under that umbrella of uh, stability of the ECB, of the Eurozone, etc. And going back to the uh, Lira, this is a, a discussion that keeps popping up. Wouldn't it be better for some countries to have their own currency again so they can devaluate and become competitive? So personally, I'm very cynical about this because it doesn't address any of the structural issues at all. Italy has tried this in the past so many times. Um, and basically, uh, for a very short-term effect, the competitiveness improves, but then immediately inflation goes up, etc. And there's a lot of empirical research showing that um, what the effects on growth and employment, these devaluations have delivered nothing. And in fact, there was a period when uh, Italy was, still had its own currency, but was solidly locked into the European monetary system at the time. Of course, they dropped out later. But during that period, growth was strong in Italy and unemployment was really going down. So also for Italy being part of a stable, non-inflationary monetary system is very valuable in terms of confidence, trust, the value of assets. So, no, I don't think that's, that's going to happen. Uh, I'm aware, and you are more aware than me, about the recent discussion about Italy breaking the uh, agreement of stopping the deficit at 1.6% and going to 24 And it's debatable, very debatable. And personally, I don't agree how they're going to spend the extra money. But do you have an idea? Uh, would you be able to have a forecast? I don't want to hold anybody to that and how this is going to pair up, because uh, if you allow Italy to exceed what has been agreed, why the others shouldn't do the same, and then you generate a lot of money of hazard. Yeah. Uh, do you think Europe will be able to constrain the agreements, uh, or they will let that, because earlier on you said Italy will be left on its own if they default. So will, they, will you let them break the rules, or will you forced through the fiscal problem. Um, you make it very personal in the sense that you ask, what will you do? But I'm no longer in the job, so this is one responsibility I, I no longer have. Yeah, my forecast. So I think that the commission will put up a fight because it's also about the credibility of the commission. And um, some countries, for example, have said that the uh, fiscal surveillance should go to the ESM, to the stability mechanism, to Klaus Regling instead of Jean-Claude Juncker and Pierre Moscovici. Um, so the commission also has a, an important battle to win here. If they put up a fight, then I think that the markets will also come in supportive in the sense that they will say, well, this is not going the way we want it, um, and the spread will go up. And the combination of those two may lead to a modification of the plans. Now, there will be a lot of havoc and a lot of screaming from uh, Rome, um, and they will blame Europe for not being able to deliver on all their wonderful promises. This is happening everywhere, by the way, uh, but certainly will happen here. And uh, their plans will still go ahead in a more moderate form. They will say, we will take more time, do it step by step. That's, that's my best guess. That, And then in the end, Italy will muddle through, but I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it with any joy at all. It makes me uh, very sad. Uh, I think that if you look at Italy, if you look at how the social system works, uh, if you look at how um, income inequality is a big issue, it's a big issue everywhere, but certainly in Italy also, there are serious reforms necessary in the tax system and the social benefit system, but not these reforms. I mean, this is... This is having the cake and, and uh, what's the expression? Okay, and eating it. And too. eating it at the same time. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. How do you see the factor become a potential threat for the European Union and Eurozone? I mean, my factor is that to be contaminated from Wall Street because what happened, you mentioned the crisis is different, right? But 10 years ago, 
a lot of European banks are involved into all the derivative trading. But ten years later, until now, like for example, like Deutsche Bank, they still have a very big uh, OTC derivative positions. Uh, so if something happened in the states again, uh, will this contaminate it, contaminate it to Europe again? So have we quite, have we reformed the international financial system to where we are no longer subject to the spillovers from the American vagaries of the American market? So I thought the question was about Brexit, but um, uh, was I wrong? But more, more about Deutsche Bank because Deutsche Bank is still holding very large you know, OTC derivative positions. So I think it, there is a link, of course, with Brexit because um, mm -hmm. most of these derivatives are being managed, traded, etc., by uh, clearing houses in in the city. And uh, one of the things that I think that uh, Europe, I think the European Union and um, the supervisors in the European Union will want is to be able to supervise that financial service. And um, I think they will. Um, uh, Deutsche Bank, I don't want to talk about one particular, f I mean, Deutsche Bank still has a lot of work to do, full stop. Uh, on lots of topics. Uh, so I don't want to comment too much on individual institutions. I think that the Brexit will uh, create a new dynamic on the topic of financial supervision, uh, uh, further regulation. Well, on some of these topics, the UK has, of course, defended the city uh, in a very tough way. I can remember certain discussions in ECOFIN where it was always interesting to see an already sort of um, we should have known that it was going to end in a Brexit during the five years that I was in ECOFIN, which is the, the 28 finance ministers, so the British were always there. More and more, the British minister wouldn't intervene as if he had already left, uh, which was a sort of a, a hint that he was in his mind already leaving. But um, only if the interests of the city were at stake, then he would intervene and very tough. Um, so I think there's a couple of issues that we need to revisit once the UK has, uh, is outside of the EU. Having said that, managing a Brexit with deal or without a deal means uh, still how we're going to manage the financial services. So if there is a, a, a deal, a trade deal, a, a customs union deal, it doesn't, give, it doesn't give any guidance on what about the financial sector in the city because it's outside of trade deals. Now, of course, the best way to do that is to take more time and to say for at least the next X years, uh, we accept uh, all that the UK fulfills all our standards. Uh, we officially, we won't call it passporting, but we will say we, our assumption is that the UK still fulfills all our standards. So, but in two years time, we want to have uh, a check on that or have an agreement on that, or they must promise to formally follow all our rules and regulations. So it is going to come a point where the UK needs to answer the question, also for their financial sector, whose rules are they going to follow? Now they think, this is the whole ideology of uh, global Britain, they think that they can create their own rules, but that can never happen. You have to realize that if you want to be a rule maker, nowadays you need to be part of one of the big economic powers in the world. Either your US, your China, uh, your, uh, the Eurozone. If you're outside of one of these big blocks, then you will be a rule taker. And Britain is going to be, also for the financial sector, a rule taker. I, 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 this, I don't mean to offend anyone, but that's what I think will happen. And then the question is going to be, whose rules are you going to take? Are you going to take the American rules or the European rules? Now, given the position of the city, for a large part of the markets, I mean, there are different markets and different products, of course, they will have to be the rule takers from the EU. And that's the only way that the city can do its work the way it's doing now for all of Europe. Then you have to look back and think, why did we do this Brexit? <laughs> Okay, yeah. that's, a, I think, a good note to end the evening on. I, I have to call the evening to a halt, I'm afraid. I want to thank all of you for your attention and your participation. But most of all, I would like you to join me in thanking Jeroen Jezobolon for an amazing, masterful survey. 
of Europe international financial architecture and the way ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you.